high school, a time in your life that is either remembered as some of the best or worst days, a time of new friends, new temptations, and sometimes even heartbreak. But one thing we all hoped for was that we could count on our best friends to be by our side through it all. Today, we are diving into the heartbreaking case of 16-year-old Skylar Nees, a girl whose bright future was cut short by those who claimed to love her most. A disturbing case that shows even those we are closest to can want the worst for us. and welcome to or welcome back to my YouTube channel. I am so excited that you are here and I hope that you are truly having an absolutely fantastic morning, afternoon, or night, whatever it is for you when this video finally reaches you. Today, we are diving into yet another episode in my new series here on my channel, Kids That Kill, where we take a deeper look into true crime cases surrounding some of the world's youngest killers. Today, we are diving into the heartbreaking case of Skylar Niece, and let me just tell you guys, when I first heard about this case years ago, I was absolutely shocked, especially when I dug deeper into the social media profiles of the killers. So this case is absolutely crazy and truly devastating. I do want to mention that I have both of my dogs in here. You can currently only see one of them because Ace is somewhere under a pillow. So if you see a pillow moving at any given point in time throughout today's video, it's just Ace. Don't worry. It's not a ghost or anything. And if you hear any snoring or snorting, she's responsible. But I'm hoping that I don't totally put her to sleep and that she doesn't get into too deep of a sleep because She's a snorer. Before we continue on into today's case though, I do want to thank today's video sponsor, Blackout Bingo. Now, if you guys have been on my channel at all recently, you guys would know that I have been absolutely obsessed with Blackout Bingo and I get so excited every single time I get to talk about Blackout Bingo with you guys. Blackout Bingo is a super fun mobile game where you can make money while playing bingo. You and your competitor get the same bingo card, but as time goes on, the numbers start coming faster and faster and faster. So winning is entirely based on how quickly you can react. And honestly, it is so much fun. Like even though I'm competing with other people, I'm constantly trying to like beat my own records with how quickly I can play the game. So Blackout Bingo is owned by Skills. And one thing that I have to say about Skills is Skills has amazing support and prides themselves on their ability to match players based on their personal skill level. I do want to mention though if you do want to play for free they do have free head-to-head -head games as well which are also so much fun. But if you are playing for cash I should also mention that you're able to cash out at any time. What I personally love is that now you don't have to go anywhere to play bingo. You can play anytime, anywhere from your mobile device and even win cash. Getting started is as easy as clicking the link down below. I will have it linked at the very top of my description. And if you use my code Reese, you will get an extra $5 in free cash to play on the app once you make your first deposit. So make sure that you guys click the link at the very top of my description and use my code Reese. It is so much fun, and as I mentioned, if you get good at the game, you can win cash prizes, and you might just end up getting matched with me, which would be so much fun. So make sure that you click the link at the very top of my description. Use my code Reese. I promise you guys will have so much fun playing this game. I truly, wholeheartedly, sincerely love Blackout Bingo, so thank you so much to Blackout Bingo for sponsoring, and without further ado, let's get into today's case. <laughs> So Skylar Annette Niece was born on February 10th, 1996 to her mother Mary and her father Dave. So Skylar was an only child and was her parents' entire world. Listening to her parents speak about how much love they had for Skylar is so pure. Like they loved her 
beyond words. Skylar was described as an easy child, a daddy's girl. In a lot of interviews, her father like reminisces on all the sports they used to play together. She was a daddy's girl through and through and was just a kind soul. Something that was always really important to Skylar was her friends and maintaining her friendships. She was said to be a very, very good friend. Her friends were at the center of her universe and she loved the outdoors and adventures. She was also a really great student and took her studies very seriously. Skylar's dad said that Skylar was just beyond her years from the very beginning. She walked before she was supposed to, spoke before she was supposed to. She reached milestones very quickly all throughout her childhood. When Skylar would just be eight years old, she would meet what will become one of her absolute best friends, a girl named Sheila Eddy. The two of them did go to different schools, but they would spend as much time as they possibly could together and they were just the best of friends right off the get-go. Now from the beginning, Skylar's parents thought that Sheila was a nice little girl. She too was an only child so they did connect on that and they kind of became sisters quickly. But Sheila came from more of a broken household. Her parents were divorced and her father was disabled and her childhood was just more difficult than Skylar's. Very quickly, Sheila became a part of the niece family. She would come into their house pretty much unannounced, kind of just like what you see in the movies or TV shows with best friends where they just walk into each other's homes and nobody's alarmed by that. The niece family actually took her in in a sense and looked at her as like a second daughter. They said that the two of them were inseparable despite going to different schools and elementary school and they called themselves sisters, often saying things like we're sisters for life, that is my sister. And as I said, Skylar's parents loved Sheila. They took her in as their own. Now, as I mentioned, the two of them did go to different schools all through elementary school, but come high school, they were gonna be going to the exact same high school and the girls could not be any more excited for this. All of their friends and family said it was all they would talk about, the fact that the two of them were gonna get to go to school together and spend even more time together. Skylar's parents described this time in Skylar's life as her and Sheila being like pretty much bonded 24 seven. They would spend the day at school together, they would hang out after school, and when they were apart, they would talk on the phone all night long. They were in constant communication with each other. And while Sheila was almost part of the niece family and they viewed her as a second child, they did notice a couple of things about Sheila that they weren't particularly fond of. One of which being, it almost felt to them like Sheila felt the world revolved around her, and she was very controlling of Skylar's every move. Basically, whatever Sheila said went and Skylar's moves were pretty much controlled by Sheila. Sheila also was a lot more rebellious than Skylar was. Sheila was just an overall more rebellious teen than Skylar was. Skylar was really focused on her future, her education, and being a good kid. During her freshman year in high school, Sheila and Skylar made friends with another girl named Rachel. Now Rachel came from a more conservative background, but she wasn't shy at all to say the least and the three of them became inseparable. People all throughout the school said it was a rare occurrence to see them without one another. They spent all of their time together and they were just like the best of friends. Now, Skylar's parents obviously didn't know Rachel as well as they knew Sheila because they'd known Sheila since the girls were eight years old, but they described her as seeming to be a nice girl. They thought that she was an okay friend for Skylar. Skylar had a job at Wendy's that she took very seriously but when she was older, she wanted to become a criminal lawyer and her parents felt like this would be an awesome job for her. Um, they were really supportive of her pursuing that as her future career. And during this time as well, Sheila's home life seemed to be getting better. Now like Sheila, Rachel came from divorced parents as well and now even though she had an older stepbrother, she too was raised as an only child. So the three of them had like that only child mentality. From the outside looking in, the three of them had what appeared to be a dream friendship. People truly thought this was going to be a lifelong friendship. Despite the fact that often in high school friendships, once you go off to college or university, people tend to, you know, go different directions in life but people would have bet money on the fact that these three were going to be friends until the end. They were always with each other. But like most uneven friend groups, there does often come times where someone feels like the odd one out. You know, two people seem to be getting closer than the other or two people are hanging out more than the other and there tends to be jealousy, 
and arguments surrounding this. I remember being in friend groups of three and there would be different periods throughout the year that certain ones of us were closer to others, if that makes sense. So I can totally understand why this started to happen with the girls. Rachel and Sheila began getting closer and closer and Skylar started to feel very left out. Now remember, I told you at the beginning of this video, Skylar centered a lot of her life around her friendships. She was very, very hurt when the two of them started hanging out without her, coordinating outfits and not letting her in on it. She started to feel like the odd one out of the group. Now in summer of 2012, Rachel and Sheila were as close as can be. So close that rumors were kind of flying through the school and the community that despite them having boyfriends, there could be a possibility that the two of them were romantic with each other. They were only really spending time with one another. They were posting like suggestive pictures and tweeting suggestive things to one another that kind of made people go, hmm, I wonder if there could be something more going on, but the girls never confirmed this. Now these girls used Twitter almost as though it were a diary of sorts. They would post their every feeling, their every thought, even some things that you would look at and be like, hmm, it's a little TMI, um, but they used Twitter religiously. And so when things would be kind of rocky between them, they would often take to Twitter to express their feelings of hurt or anger or jealousy and kind of sub subtweet one another. On July 4th, 2012, Skylar was once again not invited to plans that Rachel and Sheila had made, and she was feeling exceptionally low about this. So much so, her parents felt absolutely terrible for their daughter and tried to suggest things like reading or other things that she could do to kind of get her mind off of it. But I mean, she was feeling left out. There was nothing that she could do that wasn't gonna make her feel that sense of missing out and that jealousy. Like remember, Sheila was her childhood best friend and now it almost seemed like Skylar was not as important to her anymore, which is hard for any teenager to grasp. So as I mentioned, they would often take to Twitter during these times and Skylar did just that. Skylar made it very known on social media how she was feeling about being left out. And I'm actually gonna insert a series of tweets that Skylar made where you can get a glimpse into how she was feeling. And one thing that I wanna say is I know there's gonna be people who are gonna say, well, you know what, it's not the end of the world, maybe find a new friend group, but at 16 years old, it feels like the end of the world when you're losing friendships and relationships that you've built. And it sucks to miss out as a teenager. I remember that feeling. So yeah, I'm gonna show you guys some of the tweets that Skylar was making to give you an inside as to how she was feeling. June 30th, 2012, Skylar tweeted, three of my best friends are going out of town this weekend, leaving me alone with no plans, FML. On July 3rd, 2012, Skylar tweeted, people can be so mean for absolutely no reason. On July 4th, 2012, Skylar tweeted, sick of being at home, thanks, friends, love hanging out with all of you too. And on July 5th, 2012, if you take a look at the time there at 10.48 p.m., Skylar tweeted, you doing stuff like this is why I will never completely trust you. But beyond this, Skylar's other friends and family really weren't keen on this friendship anymore anyways, and they were hoping that Skylar would pull back and maybe find herself a new friend group or maybe just hang out with some of her other friends more. The girls had discovered drinking, smoking, sneaking out. They were in a rebellious phase. And as I mentioned, Sheila was a rebellious teenager. Skylar was a straight A student. She worked really hard on her education, took her job at Wendy seriously. So people close to her were like, Skylar, who cares? They're showing their true colors. But to Skylar, this felt like the end of the world. She wanted to be in that group. She wanted to be friends with them. And I do want to note, it wasn't just those closest to Skylar who felt like Sheila was a bad influence. Those that were close to Rachel as well felt like Sheila was changing Rachel. It almost seemed like at the center of the group, Sheila was this rebellious one discovering all these things and was being the bad influence on the girls. But I do want to say, you never truly know. Trust me, I remember from high school, 
parents would be like, oh, you know, that my kid's being bad because their friend is influencing them. But then like behind the scenes, you're like, nah, -uh, they're all pretty bad. So <laughs> who truly knows, right? So on July 5th, 2012, Skylar had just worked a shift at Wendy's until 10 p.m. and returned home to find her parents watching TV. Her parents said that she seemed totally normal, she expressed to them that she was going to be heading to bed soon, and she kissed her mother, told her she loved her, kissed her father, told him that she loved him, and then went upstairs to what they thought was go to bed. But Skylar had different plans. Skylar had plans to sneak out of her bedroom window that night, and at 12.30 she did exactly that. Skylar jumped out of her window, placed a bench outside of her window so that she could easily get back into her window, and went to go and meet her friends. And I'm so sorry, she is snoring. I don't know if you guys can hear it. I feel terrible. Now this wasn't unusual. This wasn't an isolated incident of Skylar sneaking out. Like I said, the girls had discovered all of these rebellious things and sneaking out was one of them. So this wasn't the first time Skylar had done this. Skylar knew what she was doing and she knew who she was meeting. The next morning, Skylar's parents woke up, Skylar's door was closed, and they assumed that Skylar was just still sleeping. Skylar was scheduled to work at Wendy's at 4 p.m. on this day, so her dad returned home in the afternoon to bring the car back so that Skylar would have it to take to her shift at Wendy's. And that was when he discovered her door was still closed. He tried to knock on it, call out for Skylar, but he didn't hear anything. Now, when he went into Skylar's room, he discovered that Skylar was not in her room at all, and he basically immediately had a really bad feeling. He called Skylar's mom and he told her that Skylar wasn't in her room, and his wife's initial reaction wasn't too alarming. She kind of felt like, hey, maybe Skylar's out with friends. It's summer. She could have plans. You know, don't stress it. I'm sure she's fine. And so he was like, okay, I, I guess you're right. But he did notice that the screen was out of her window. And when he went outside, he discovered that the bench was there as well, leading him to believe that Skylar had snuck out of the window. Skylar's mom encouraged Skylar's dad to call Sheila because who else would know where Skylar would be more than Sheila? And so he did exactly that. He called Sheila and he asked her if she had any idea where Skylar could be or why she wasn't at home. And Sheila proceeded to tell him that she had no idea where Skylar could be. She didn't have any information and that she had last spoken to Skylar the night before at around midnight, that she texted Skylar but that was it, she didn't have any information. He had called Skylar saying, hey, you are in big trouble, call me back, this isn't cool, something along those lines, and then he called back Skylar's mom to say like, hey, Sheila doesn't have any information as to where Skylar could be. But Skylar's mom suggested that they wait and see if she shows up for her shift at Wendy's at four o'clock, because she was very, very responsible when it came to her work, and they knew that she would show up for her shift at four o'clock. So they decided that they were gonna wait until after she had like had time to clock in at Wendy's, and then they were gonna give Wendy's a call and make sure that Skylar was there at her job. But this would not play out in that way. Shortly after Skylar was scheduled to work at Wendy's, they received a phone call from Wendy's saying, hey, uh, Skylar didn't show up to work. Do you have any idea of where she could be? And it was at this moment they knew something was terribly wrong. Because like I mentioned, this was very out of character for Skylar. Despite hanging out with girls who were rebelling and participating in things as well, she was responsible when it came to her schoolwork and her work, and she would never have just not shown up for her shift like that. I have a daughter that's 16 years old. Apparently she snuck out of her room last night and she hasn't been seen since. None of her friends can get all over. I can't find her. Hey, what's her name? Skylar Niece. The police were called immediately and told that they believed that their daughter had snuck out and that she still hadn't returned home, and her parents were calling anybody who could have any sort of information as to where Skylar could be but they were getting nothing. That was until Little Miss Sheila calls back again, this time changing her story, telling Skylar's parents, I need to tell you the truth about last night, because now I'm worried. Sheila's new story was that they had snuck out at around 11 p.m. picking Skylar up, that they'd only spent about an hour together smoking, hanging out, but that when they went to drop Skylar back off at home, Skylar requested to be dropped off up the street so that it wouldn't alarm her parents, like they wouldn't hear the car or Skylar kind of coming back in. She wanted to be 
discreet, about sneaking back in according to Sheila. At this point, the niece family and anybody who could were all looking anywhere that they could to try to find a Skylar. And interestingly enough, Sheila and her mother also joined in in looking for Skylar. And immediately, Sheila seemed very concerned. She seemed like a very concerned friend who wanted to know if everything was okay with Skylar. They were going door to door asking anybody if they'd seen anything or heard anything. They were trying to think of any way that they could get any sort of indication as to where Skylar might be. And that was when Skylar's mom remembered that there had just been new cameras installed in their building. So they went to the landlord to obtain any footage from the night before. And that was when they discovered that they did capture Skylar running towards a car and willingly getting inside of it. The footage is super blurry and really hard to make out, so they couldn't tell like the make or model or license plate of the car, but they could see that Skylar clearly knew the person that she was getting into the vehicle with. It wasn't like she was abducted in any way, shape, or form. But the vehicle that Skylar was getting into was at 12.30 and not 11. Now, Skylar's parents had no reason not to believe Sheila and Sheila's story, and Sheila seemed really concerned about Skylar. So the new theory in Skylar's mom's mind was that Skylar had been dropped back off at around midnight and then snuck back out and gotten into somebody else's car that wasn't Sheila and Rachel. This was the only thing that could make sense because they trusted Sheila. She was like part of their family. Now the police initial theory was that Skylar was just a runaway. I mean, they had the footage of her willingly running and getting into this car. And at this time, you couldn't issue an Amber Alert for somebody who wasn't abducted. Hold on, I gotta wake her up a bit because she is snoring. The police were pretty convinced at this point in the investigation that Skylar had ran away, but Skylar's parents were adamant that this was so out of character for Skylar. Skylar was not one to run away, despite the fact that yeah, she had snuck out or yeah, she was partaking in things that she shouldn't be, it was just typical teenage behavior. She loved her family, she loved her friends, she loved her school, she enjoyed her job. There was no reason for Skylar to run away and her parents were doing anything and everything that they could to really push this to law enforcement, to look for their daughter more. But at this point, they were just viewing it as a runaway and weren't utilizing every resource they could to locate her. So Skylar's parents felt pretty abandoned in the initial process of the investigation and they really didn't know what they could do. They started putting posters absolutely anywhere that they could, hoping that somebody would have seen something or seen Skylar or knew something. They were encouraging Skylar to just come home, even saying, Skylar, you're not in trouble anymore. We get it. Just come home and be with us. We miss you. We need you. We love you. And Rachel and Sheila seemed devastated that their best friend was missing. Sheila wanted to know everything to do with the investigation. Even at one point, Sheila showed up at Skylar's house, asked her parents if she could go up to Skylar's room. Skylar's mom and her sat on Skylar's bed, crying together, comforting one another. She was absolutely visibly devastated. Or so it seemed, but let's continue. But a few days after Skylar had initially disappeared, law enforcement switched up their tone. They'd done some digging into who Skylar truly was, talked to people closest to her and realized it was very unlikely that she was a runaway. She was responsible and she had no reason to run away. She had a great home life. She had a seemingly good life. So the West Virginia State Police and the FBI joined in on the search to help Skylar and this gave her family some hope, despite the fact they felt like a couple days had been wasted. It didn't take long for Sheila to be interviewed by law enforcement, and immediately they kind of felt like something was off with her. For one, she was cool as a cucumber. She made a lot of eye contact. Her story was very seamless. She knew from start to finish how the night had went, almost as if she had rehearsed it. And it was also noted that her story meshed seamlessly with Rachel's story as well. But Rachel's demeanor was very different than Sheila's. Rachel was described as more fidgety, more uncomfortable. She lacked eye contact. She wasn't as confident in her answers, but her answers were exactly like Sheila's, almost as though they had rehearsed what went down that night. But Rachel was actually interviewed after Sheila was. On July 6th, Rachel had went on a boating trip with her family, and then following that, she'd actually went to church camp. So she wasn't immediately available 
for questioning. They did question her over the phone briefly, but it wasn't until she came in that they really recognized that her behavior was very different than Sheila's. Rachel was pretty adamant to law enforcement that Sheila definitely knew more than her and kind of pushing them to talk to Sheila about it even though her story was in alignment. She wasn't as forthcoming as Sheila. That's a really good way to put it. Actually, Sheila was very, um, she wanted to be at the center of the investigation. She wanted to know what they knew. She wanted to give any information that she could, even if there was a lack of information. And um, yeah, she really had it together. Um, she was also described by law enforcement as narcissistic and self-centered from what they could gather from when they spoke to her, which is a common theme in how people have described her. So as I mentioned, they had initially spoken to Sheila and then they'd called Rachel over the phone and they encouraged Rachel to come in for an in-person interview, which would be essential, obviously, for the investigation as they seemed to be the last two known people who had seen her. Um, but Rachel wasn't really too keen on rushing to come in for an interview. Um, she was pretty hard for them to get a hold of. Uh, which obviously doesn't look too fabulous, honestly. But something to note was that law enforcement was kind of looking at anything and everything they could to get an indication of where Skylar could have went. And they found an interesting diary entry regarding the two girls in Skylar's diary. Skylar basically explained how one night the girls had been drinking and Sheila and Rachel basically hooked up like right in front of Skylar with one another, um, they were very intimate, and Skylar was very, very uncomfortable, but she couldn't leave um, because she didn't want their parents to know that they had been drinking. They had like snuck liquor from like a liquor cabinet, and they weren't supposed to be drinking, obviously, they're all 16 years old. So Skylar was very uncomfortable about this. Now remember, like I told you guys earlier on in this video, there was speculation that allegedly Rachel and Sheila were seeing each other romantically. And then you look inside of Skylar's diary and she describes a very uncomfortable situation. So this was something interesting that they did take note of. Everyone in the community was distraught over Skylar's disappearance. There were so many rumors flying around as to what could have happened to Skylar. And a lot of people felt like Rachel and Sheila definitely knew more. And honestly, besides Skylar's parents, Sheila really seemed to be so heavily affected by the disappearance of Skylar. There were so many social media posts. Um, she was constantly checking in with Skylar's parents. She seemed really worried and seemed to not be too keen on the rumors going around. You know, school rolled back around and Sheila was posting about how hard it was doing school without Skylar, how much she needed Skylar to come home. And often Skylar's parents would comment on these posts saying like, stay strong, sweetie. We love you. It's going to be okay. Things of that nature. The heartbreaking thing was that Skylar's mom had a really bad feeling that Skylar may not be with them anymore. As I said, she knew Skylar hadn't ran away. She, she didn't even think that was a possibility. And even if she had, she hadn't taken anything that you would take with you if you were expecting to leave home for a prolonged period of time. She'd left everything important, including her like most prized possessions at her house. It just, it didn't make any sense. So the only real thought that she had was that maybe Skylar was kidnapped. But it seems it wasn't just talk of the town that Rachel and Sheila could be involved in this because on September 3rd, a warrant was issued and both Sheila and Rachel's electronics were seized by law enforcement. Despite this though, Sheila continued to share her heartbreak online. And I'm actually gonna read you guys, I just pulled it up here, a post that Sheila had posted as well. So it says, Skylar, sorry I haven't been posting in a while. School has been taking up all my time. I miss you so much in school. Me and Rachel miss you so much, especially at lunch. We sit at the lunch table alone. Come back so we don't look like loners anymore. LOL, school is so hard without you. Actually, everything is hard without you. I seriously think about you 24 seven and miss talking to you on the phone day and night. I know you wouldn't like some of the things that are being said lately, so please come home and prove them all wrong. I've been doing absolutely everything I can to help and I know you'd be thankful for that. I don't know why you haven't come home yet, but if you're scared that people will be mad at you, they won't be. We all just want you home safely. I miss you so, so, so much more than you could ever imagine. And you will always, always, always 
be my best friend. Remember that. The post seems very heartfelt, um, but the law enforcement still felt like there was something up with Sheila and Rachel. They felt like they weren't being forthcoming with information that they may have. And honestly, the craziest part is that Skylar's parents felt really bad for Sheila. Like they felt like law enforcement was wasting time targeting Sheila and digging into Sheila and Rachel because they were their best friends and they were grieving Skylar being missing too. They actually went and confronted law enforcement and said, hey, cut this out. They're hurting too. They were advocating for the girls. But surveillance footage would later confirm that the car that had picked her up at 12.30 a.m was in fact Sheila's car. And surely law enforcement was able to start connecting some dots as to what truly happened after Skylar had gotten into Sheila's car. And they were finding holes in the girls' stories. It was not adding up to what they had told law enforcement so seamlessly. The girls had in fact driven to Blacksville the night of Skylar's disappearance, despite having told law enforcement that they had not gone there. And at the time that they initially said that they were together with her, they were texting her. So this didn't line up to the timeline either. And I do want to note that throughout this time, as the girls are being investigated, Sheila's mom was really pushing back on law enforcement. She did not support them looking into her daughter whatsoever. So the police theory now shifted. They knew the girls knew more than they were letting on. They knew that Sheila and Rachel had been the ones to pick her up and therefore were the last ones that they knew of to see Skylar but they weren't thinking that they had done anything to Skylar. They felt like they were covering for Skylar. The new theory was that perhaps Skylar had overdosed or something had happened at a party or while the girls were out and that they were too afraid to come forward and tell them the truth. So they were telling the girls like, just tell us if something happened to her and you're covering it, tell us, you won't be in trouble, we just need to know. They knew the girls were hiding something. So as I mentioned, up until this point, Rachel and Sheila had been on the exact same page when it came to their stories, until all of a sudden, they weren't. And Rachel now came forward with a new version of what had taken place that night. Rachel now claimed that they hadn't dropped Skylar off up the road, but that Skylar had in fact ran into the forest and that the two girls tried to chase after her and find her, but they couldn't find her anywhere and they had no idea what happened to her. And interestingly enough, the next time that law enforcement spoke to Sheila, she now had this exact same script of a story as well. They were once again seamlessly connecting their stories, but the story had changed dramatically. Because it was obvious that the girls hadn't been entirely truthful from the beginning, they felt as though a polygraph test on both of the girls might be their best way or best chance to kind of figure out what's fact and what's fiction. Sheila took the polygraph test and completely failed it, and Rachel seemed to be avoiding the polygraph test. When it came time for Rachel to take the polygraph test, she actually hopped out of the car and ran to Sheila's house to talk to Sheila's mom and try to get some sort of help from her, because like I mentioned, Sheila's mom was like not on board with the girls being investigated, so she must have thought maybe she could help her somehow. By December 16th, 2012, it was very evident to law enforcement and Skylar's family that the girls were for sure holding back information and they knew something about what had happened to Skylar that night. Skylar's mom started taking to social media, making a lot of posts kind of hinting like, tell the truth, karma's gonna get you, and even concluding one of the posts saying, it's time for these girls to come forward with everything they know. Our family needs closure to move on, whether it be with Skylar's remains or best scenario, that it be Skylar herself. So she's making it clear. She thinks something's up and she thinks they know. Christmas rolled around and Skylar's parents did not celebrate. They did not put up a tree. They didn't do anything for Christmas. They treated it as just another day. And every day without Skylar, their hearts were breaking more and more with the unknown of what could have happened to her. At this point, Rachel begins to decline dramatically. Her mental health is very clearly suffering. Some people speculated it was because she was being accused of something she didn't do or she was worried about Skylar, while others felt like it was eating at her to be withholding so much information. Classmates said that Rachel was not herself at all. It was very obvious that she was struggling and things would hit a very 
low point for Rachel. On December 28th, there would be a huge outburst with Rachel and her family, resulting in her mom actually calling the police on her. Rachel was screaming, hysterical. I saw in one interview that she locked herself in her bedroom, shoved her dresser up against the door, said she didn't want to be here anymore. She was like unconsolable. She was violent. She was being violent towards her parents. Like they were at a breaking point with her and she was clearly at a mental breaking point as well and the police had to step in. And this would result in Rachel being admitted to a psychiatric facility for five days. Now Sheila would attempt multiple times to go and visit Rachel, but the staff had been informed that they were not allowed to see each other. This was just not gonna happen. But it is unknown as to what Sheila wanted to talk about with Rachel. Once Rachel was released, the case would take a dramatic and disturbing turn. Immediately after being released, Rachel went to her lawyer's office where they had called law enforcement in to talk with Rachel. Now they started asking Rachel a couple of questions and it was very obvious that Rachel was unwell. She had a garbage bin next to her because she felt as though she was going to throw up and after just a couple of questions, she looked at the officers and said, we stabbed her. Rachel then proceeded to explain that during spring break, Sheila and Skylar had spent it together and when Sheila came back, she was just so annoyed with Skylar. She allegedly told Rachel that all the two had done was fight and that she needed to go. She needed to get rid of Skylar. So the two would scheme for months as to what they would do to get rid of Skylar and the events of this night that Skylar disappeared are truly disgusting. That night, Skylar was reluctant to sneak out at all. She was really on the fence as to whether or not she was gonna sneak out and meet the girls, but ultimately, probably from like the fear of missing out, decided, you know what, I'm gonna go be with my friends, this is all I've wanted, and she snuck out of her window, as we saw in that surveillance footage, heading straight for Sheila's car. What she didn't know was prior to them coming to pick her up, both Rachel and Sheila loaded up the trunk with all of their essentials for the evening, including, but not limited to, a change of clothes, cleaning supplies, a shovel, etc. Just everything that they would need. Skylar got into the back seat of Sheila's car, Sheila was driving, and Rachel was in the passenger seat, and the girls drove off to go to a secluded spot they'd been to before to smoke at and hang out. Once they got there, the girls talked for a couple of minutes and then got out of the car, and that was when I've read that she either went to do it on her own or she was asked to, but I believe um, that Skylar was going back to the car to grab a lighter, but either way, she was going back towards the car, and that's when Sheila said, on three. Sheila allegedly called out one, two, three, and the two of them pulled out kitchen knives and began to stab Skylar over 50 Skylar was screaming and trying to run, but due to her injuries, she was unable to do so, but she was able to cut Rachel, and Rachel claims this is when she decided to stop, but Sheila just kept on going, and they watched her until she passed away, which is just so disgusting. Um, they then went to the vehicle to get their supplies, getting the shovel, and tried to dig, but then realized that the ground was far too hard, so they just dragged her and hid her in the woods. And then proceeded to go to a body of water nearby and clean themselves off, change their clothes, and leave. The most disturbing part of this case, well, I don't even know if I could say the most, but a very disturbing part of this case was that Rachel claimed that Skylar's last words was why. She just wanted to know why they were doing this to her, which it actually makes me emotional even picturing this because she knew Sheila since she was eight years old. That was her sister for life, her best friend, someone that her parents had taken in as like a second daughter. Anybody would be like, why? And that was her final words. The officers were obviously shocked and disgusted. They knew the girls had more involvement, but they did not think that the girls had done this. They truly thought that something had just went wrong and they were covering or that they knew where she was and they just weren't saying. They were not expecting this and it was a complete shock. Obviously, they asked her, why? Why did you do this? And the answer is just disgusting. 
Rachel proceeds to say that they did it because they didn't want to be friends with her anymore and they just didn't like her. You know, a lot of us decide we don't want to be friends with people anymore. You don't get to do this and rid a family of their daughter, but let's continue. Police asked her if she could lead them to the body, to which she said yes, but at this point in time, the area was covered in snow and she couldn't specifically remember like where exactly the body was, so they had to wait until the area was cleared for them to go back and to see it. But at this point, they did not arrest her immediately. Up until this point, the stories had changed so many times, it was obvious that they were lying and they needed concrete evidence to prove that this is really what happened. So Sheila had no idea that Rachel had confessed everything and told them everything and the two of them were still free. Now this came as a shock to Rachel's family because as I mentioned, she had a boating trip with her family that following day, like the same day technically, but during the day. And while they did notice the cut that she had, she was acting totally normal, like her normal self. But they did notice that she was on her phone a little bit more than normal, um, which now they believe she was talking back and forth with Sheila, trying to get information, etc. But they really didn't see any signs, which that is so terrifying. So as I mentioned, Sheila had absolutely no idea that her cover had been blown, that Rachel had confessed and broken down. And so she kept continuing her act with her posts about how much she misses her best friend and she wants her best friend to come back and yada, yada, yada. And I should mention Skylar's parents did not know Rachel's confession at this given point in time. They did not tell them until they were sure of everything that had happened. They wanted to gather as much incriminating evidence against Sheila as they could, even like wiring Rachel and sending her to go hang out with Sheila, which she did. I'll insert a picture here from that day that they did hang out, but they didn't say anything incriminating. I guess maybe Rachel was nervous or the conversation just didn't come up, um, but they really needed to get that concrete evidence. So a warrant was issued for both Sheila and Rachel's like knives in their house, and they wanted to check Sheila's trunk, where they would find DNA. They found blood in Sheila's trunk, and on top of that, Rachel's confession seemed to be true when they did discover the remains that they believed were of Skylar's niece. The remains were, in fact, identified as Skylar, and in March of 2013, it was released to the public that Skylar's body had been found. But here's where it gets even more disturbing. On March 13th, Sheila keeps her act going and proceeds to make a series of tweets about how upset she is to hear the news of the passing of her best friend. But beyond just the tweets of when her body was discovered, Sheila had been making quite the compilation of tweets on her Twitter. And I'm gonna actually insert them here now. I'm gonna insert quite a few of them because now that you know what truly happened, these tweets, are disgusting. On January 13th, 2013, Sheila tweets, why is my favorite question. On January 21st, 2013, Sheila tweets, I miss my best friend. And again, on January 21st, 2013, Sheila tweets, I feel like everyone I usually text on a daily basis died overnight. On January 22nd, 2013, Sheila tweets, wonder if there's a law and order where they don't figure it out. On February 21st, 2013, Sheila tweets, Can I just say again that I absolutely love having the upper hand? On February 26th, 2013, Sheila tweets, Weird to think that if you did one thing differently, your life would probably be so different now. And on April 1st, 2013, Sheila tweets, We really did go on three. On April 27th, 2013, Sheila tweets, Ain't no rest for the wicked. And on April 28th, 2013, Sheila tweets, It's so weird how people fight with their best friend. Like, I never fight with mine. Also tweeting on April 28th, 2013, I hate seeing or hearing things that remind me of you because you're the last person I want to be reminded of. And after the news broke, Sheila tweets, Worst day of my whole life. Following this, she retweets, My thoughts and prayers are to the niece family. I can't imagine the pain you're going through. Something's gotta change. Way too many babies dying. Following it up with, The pain is real. 
also posting multiple photos of them saying, rest easy, Skylar, you'll always be my best friend. I miss you more than you could ever know. But on March 31st, 2013, Sheila tweets, not even worried about it. Despite Rachel's confession, Sheila wasn't the only one posting about how sad they were about Skylar. Rachel actually posted as well, rest in peace, baby. I love and miss you more than anything. May you finally have justice. And I'm gonna touch on what I think about this afterwards because there's a whole thing after court and whatnot that I do wanna touch on with that, but let's continue. The blood in Sheila's car was successfully identified as Skylar's and law enforcement had all of the evidence that they needed to convict the two girls. On May 1st, 2013, Rachel turned herself in and pled guilty to murder in the second degree. And Sheila had just finished eating with her mother at Cracker Barrel when she was arrested in the parking lot for murder in the first degree. Supposedly, she was acting very shocked about this and she kept asking her mom, is everything gonna be okay? Is everything gonna be okay? To which her mom kept replying, I don't know. Sheila was facing one count of kidnapping, one count of first degree murder, and one count of conspiracy to commit murder, but Sheila pleaded not guilty to all of the charges. The trial began on October 22nd, 2013, but it was postponed to January 28th, 2014. However, Sheila would decide to take a plea deal. On January 24th, 2014, Sheila pled guilty to murder in the first degree. Sheila was sentenced to life in prison and Rachel was sentenced to 30 years in prison. However, Sheila was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 15 years and Rachel was sentenced to 30 years with the possibility of parole after 10 years. I don't understand that, and obviously Skylar's parents were devastated by that news. I've actually read in a couple of articles that Skylar's dad claims like over his dead body will those girls get out on parole. He's gonna do everything in his power to ensure they stay behind bars forever, but that was definitely a controversial sentence. I mean, if you think about it, they were only 16 years old, meaning that Rachel could be out when she's 26 years old. That's kind of crazy to think. Now, Rachel did apologize to Skylar's family in court, claiming that she had gotten caught up in something much bigger than she realized. She didn't realize the weight of her actions. She knows there's no words. I'm just summarizing here, but she knows there's no words that can make it better. Um, Skylar's dad addressed her and said he does not accept that apology that she took his daughter's life violently and disturbingly basically and that she can take that apology and shove it where the sun don't shine because that's about what it's worth to him he and i mean rightfully so to these emotions oh face is up <laughs> um he hates these girls hates them they they both think that they are sick and clearly they are. You don't do that to your best friend if you're not sick. Sheila, on the other hand, never seemed to show any remorse for her actions whatsoever and just really showed lack of empathy for the family and everything that she had done. So that's crazy. But there are people who believe that Rachel was pulled into this by Sheila, that Rachel would have never have done this if Sheila didn't basically like not force her to, but like push her to. And they claim that Rachel genuinely feels immense remorse. And when asked about her time in prison, she adamantly says she deserves to be in there. She did something disgusting and horrible. And um, that she does feel bad about it, but who truly knows, right? Like I feel like if one of my friends, actually I know for a dang fact, if one of my friends was talking about this stuff, I would turn them in and I would not participate, but that's why I'm so fascinated by criminal psychology. What makes people do the crazy things that they do? Who kills their best friend since they were eight years old? This case is insane. Like, what? When all is said and done, people don't believe that they killed her solely because they didn't want to be friends with her anymore or they didn't want to associate with her anymore or they didn't like her anymore. A lot of people think that the two of them were in an intimate relationship. I mean, let's talk about the diary entry. She had clearly seen something to do with them and it did make her uncomfortable. Obviously that situation in general is just uncomfortable if it's not something you want to be a part of. But people think that maybe they thought Skylar was going to out them and share their secret. Um, as I mentioned, Rachel did come from a religious conservative family, so maybe that played a role in it. Um, but there's a lot of people who think that it was to do with the fact that they were lovers and she knew and thought maybe if they didn't want to be friends with her anymore, she would out them. But I did see in an interview that Skylar's parents think that the girls had to have been jealous of her. Like, what else could it be? 
Um, either way, the only ones who truly know why they did that is the two of them. And we will never truly know what went through their minds in that moment. In memory of their daughter, Dave and Mary were able to pass Skylar's law in West Virginia. And this law essentially requires Amber Alerts for all children, not just children who are thought to have been abducted. Because if you remember, that was a big thing in this case. They weren't able to issue an Amber Alert despite the parents knowing like, hey, she might look like she went willingly, but she is not out there, not coming home willingly. The nieces also transformed the wooded area where Skylar's body had been found into a memorial. And I actually wanna read you what Dave said about this in an interview with 2020. Dave Neese said, something horrible happened here, but I want to take the horrible thing that happened here and try to turn it into something good. A place that people can come and remember Skylar and remember the good little girl that she was and not the little beast they treated her like, which is, devastating. And when asked how they want their daughter to be remembered, the nieces said they want people to remember her beautiful, infectious smile. They want people to remember her smile that could light up a room and the happy, sweet little girl that she was. And I think that that's beautiful, that they want her remembered in such a way. Well guys, that is the heartbreaking and disturbing case of Skylar Niece. I want to know all of your guys' thoughts and theories down below. What do you think of that sentence more specifically, the possibility of parole? How does that make you feel? Because I know I, I was pretty shocked when I heard about that. So definitely, definitely let me know down in the comment section below. And that is it for today's video. Once again, I would just love to thank Blackout Bingo for sponsoring today's video. As I mentioned, I will have the link at the very top of my description and make sure to use my code Reese to get an extra $5 in free cash to play on the app when you make your first deposit. I promise you guys will absolutely love Blackout Bingo, so make sure to check it out. And thank you so much to Blackout Bingo for sponsoring. If you guys are new to my channel, Channel or you are just not yet subscribed but you enjoy my content I would absolutely love it more than you would ever know if you would go ahead and click that subscribe button and please give this video a big thumbs up if you did enjoy it remember my loves do all things with kindness and until next time I love you